What was his reaction? His reaction was swift. His reaction was to uh, grab the gun, grab my husband by the collar, threatening. Then what happened? I heard water and I heard thumping. Good evening, Crows. I'm Andrew, your host, and tonight we have a lover's triangle. A husband is murdered after finding his wife's live-in boyfriend. Live-in, as in living in the closet of their home. So, Crows, tonight we're going into the closet to come out of the closet. That didn't really hit. Okay, whatever. Uh, this is the story of Martha Ann Free. Let's do it. So the Freemans, we got Jeffrey, Martha, and Rafael de Jesus Roca Perez. I am horrible at accents. Rafael was a later addition. I suppose you'd consider him a stowaway on the Freeman love boat. Yeah. Anyways, Jeffrey Freeman and Martha Cockrell met their work in the 1990s. Jeffrey was born on September 11th, 1960. Another 9-11? I swear, uh, that date is cursed. Not like a cursed date. Anywho, Jeff was born to Hazel and Blaine Freeman in Bristol, Tennessee. He went to Sullivan Central High School and graduated college at the University of Tennessee, where he was known as Screamin' Freeman to his friends and family on the grounds of his love for his alma mater sports program. After college, Jeffrey settled into a good position at the C.H. Robinson's Company, a Fortune 500 provider of transportation services and third-party logistics. And it's while working for C.H. <gasps> breath time, that Jeffrey met his one-to-be, Martha. Martha Ann Cockrell was born on December 1964 in Bowling Green, Kentucky to Margaret and Clement Cockrell. She was the youngest of three siblings, and they all came from a family that owned and operated a restaurant in Kentucky named Farrell's. In 1994, 30-year-old Martha decided to pick up from Kentucky and relocate to Nashville, taking a sales job at the Tennessean, the city's daily newspaper. And it's with the Tennessean and the CH Transportations that we see our two lovebirds lives intersect. Since the Tennessean had contracted out its transportation and logistics needs to CH. And as dogs and cats do what they do, what do they do again? Martha and Jeffrey had a whirlwind romance. Traveling all around, finally eloping on March 1994, just months after meeting each other in a small little private ceremony made for two. After marrying, they bought a house in Brentwood on 5424 Incline Drive, an upscale neighborhood in Nashville, and it's there that Martha decided to quit her old job at the Tennessean and start her own company and a private investigation. So, she got her private investigator's license, quit her job, started a company, and named that company Resifax. Now, Resifax had humble beginnings, starting life in a little spare bedroom in their Brentwood home, and quickly blowing up into a commercial space with employees, paperwork, days off, that whole jazz. The company did so well, in fact, that Jeffrey ended up quitting his job at CH and started helping Martha run Resifax. Not long after Jeffrey started working with his wife at Resifax, though, Martha started experiencing mood swings. These kind of mood swings. Violent ones, characterized by high highs and very low lows. The doctors diagnosed Martha with bipolar disorder and handed her a prescription to manage it. She took the prescription as ordered and tried to go about her day, but soon she just stopped coming to work altogether, leaving Jeffrey responsible for res effects, which he diligently did. You see, bipolar disorder with these high highs, known as manias, and low lows, depression really are disabilitating to the person affected. So when Martha was on a low, which could happen for weeks to months at a time, she just couldn't get out of bed. Despite how bad Martha would feel, Jeffrey always tried to make time for her. And on the weekends, would plan these uh, kind of elaborate travel vacations and uh, you know try to break her mood a little bit, which she absolutely loved. That is, until one of them. It was kind of like a mini staycation and it happened on July 4th, 2004 in Nashville. A day in Nashville that 
Independence Day, but also is mixed with kind of a music festival. It's a big event, people are crowding the streets, having fun, popping bottles, that whole thing. Unfortunately though, Jeffrey was working so hard at Resifax that you know, by 10 o'clock he was getting tired. And Jeffrey decided to go home, but Martha, Martha was having a good old time, so Martha wanted to stay out and stay out, she did. She ended up getting a hotel room that night and came home the following day. When Martha came home, however, the day after, she changed. She was no longer interested in Jeffrey, it seems. That spark had gone. Matter of fact, it was like she was reconsidering the marriage altogether and moved out of the house and into an extended stay hotel room at the Candlewood Suites. Now Jeffrey was determined to save the marriage and he figured maybe she was just going through a spell. So you know, he helped her along the entire way of living in Candlewood Suites. He paid for her hotel room, her food, the whole nine yards, whatever Martha needed, Jeffrey provided. However, unbeknownst to Jeffrey, Martha wasn't the only one living at the hotel room. Enter Rafael de Jesus Roca Perez. Rafael de Jesus Roca Perez was born on December 24th, 1969. A Mexican national, he was in the States undocumented and was in Nashville on that same 4th of July that Martha was at when uh, she didn't come home that one night. And he was also at her hotel room that she had purchased that night and not the only one. You see, as Martha was going out, painting the town red, popping those bottles, she met Rafael and his two friends and they all went back to the hotel room and uh, had a little, you know, little bit of the naughty. So uh, that happened. But fast forward, back at the hotel room, it seems like Martha never stopped seeing one of those three men that she brought home to the hotel room and that was Raphael. She called him Christian. I did some research on to why, don't know. What we do know is that Raphael wasn't bilingual. He didn't speak very much English, so I don't know how that relationship worked, but something tells me it wasn't high in the communication department. It was probably more physical than anything. Jeffrey eventually discovered that Christian was living at the Candlewood Suites and confronted Martha about it. Which, in a surprising twist to the story, instead of a big blow up happening, Martha ended up just giving, uh, giving Christian the good old Dear John letter, you know, the boot, and getting back with Jeffrey. It was slow at first, right? It wasn't just immediately jumping back into their marriage. They still slept in separate bedrooms, but she was back home, which Jeffrey was ecstatic. However, what Jeffrey didn't know is that Christian moved back to Brentwood with Martha, actually uh, living in the closet in the bedroom she slept in. You see, when Jeffrey was out working uh, at Resifax, the company that Martha started, Martha would uh, play house with old Christian. And then when Jeffrey came home, Christian would scurry back into the closet and hide. This worked for about a month, but obviously, you can only hide something like a person living in a closet in the house for so long. It was 10 p.m. Sunday night. Jeffrey heard snoring coming from the closet in the home and discovered Christian. He opened up the closet, saw him there, and was like, whoa, there's a, there's a, there's a dude, a, a dude, a, a dude in the closet. He confronted his wife about it and demanded that she throw this man out. This man who was the same man who was in the hotel room. I mean, think about Jeffrey's state of mind here, right? He finds out about Christian at the Candlewood Suites. He tells her to kick him out, which she did, and she moves back in. And now the same dude is living in his closet. But you see, Jeffrey was a cool cat. Instead of blowing up on Martha about the dude living in his closet, 
He just told his wife that he was going to take a walk, and by the time he was done taking a walk, Christian needed to be gonzo. That didn't happen, though. Instead, Christian hid in the house, waited for Jeffrey. Jeffrey eventually finished his walk, came back into the house, and then was pounced on by Christian. Christian attacking Jeffrey with a high heel shoe, then strangling him, resulting in his death. Martha and Christian then wrapped up Jeffrey in a sleeping bag, put a plastic bag over his head, taped it shut to his neck, and put him into the spare bathroom. Then Christian and Martha cleaned up the crime scene and eliminated all the blood, fingerprints, and anything that would link them to his body. The next day, Sunday, April 11, 2005, 16 hours has passed. Martha picked up her prescription at Walgreens and then called her in-laws to tell them that their son was too sick to talk. A call that Jeffrey would routinely make. Yeah, I don't know how that was gonna work out. Uh, we'll deal with it later, right? Now, we don't know what happened between that call and what occurred next, but what we do know is that Martha decided to go to her neighbor's house and report the murder. When the neighbor answered the door, Martha said coldly, someone murdered my husband. She wasn't hysterical, she wasn't crying, Martha was just emotionless. Emotionless or is it motionless? Emotion, you get it. Regardless, uh, the neighbor did what any sane person would do and say, we need to call 911, which they did. Firefighters and police officers promptly arrived afterwards to the Brentwood home. And uh, when they arrived, Martha wasn't in the house. She was still at the neighbor's house. She walked out, saw the police and firefighters there, and so uh, greeted them. Hey, how you doing? And walked them up to the bathtub where Jeffrey's body was at. The firefighter was the first one to enter, and when he opened the door, he said he saw a man in a sleeping bag, partially zipped, with a plastic bag placed over his head, cinched to his neck. A homicide investigation quickly took place, but despite the odd state and this vicious murder that occurred, there was no evidence. It, it was odd. Almost like somebody cleaned up afterwards. And then, <laughs> the other odd thing, almost odder than that odd thing, oh, was the closet. Y you see, in the closet, they found a, a foam mattress, a Spanish-English translator book, Christian's clothing, and a bag containing nude pictures, lingerie, and a book of sexual positions. All things one would need, apparently, if they were living in a closet. Now while all this oddness is going on, they're still searching the house. Police received a report. A report of a Hispanic man running out of the Brentwood neighborhood and into a house under construction. Acting on a hunch, the police rushed over, which when they did, they were greeted by two people that were examining the house at the time. Now the two people were completely unrelated to this report of the Hispanic man running, but they did say they heard somebody upstairs in the house, finally discovering Christian in the rafters. The officers then threw Christian in the back of the car and brought him back to the Brentwood house where he was identified as the man that had been Martha's secret closet lover and was booked for the murder. At first the detectives didn't know what to think. I mean, what's going on here? But what they did know is that Martha was probably not connected to the murder and she was just a pawn in the whole thing. I mean, yeah, extremely odd, right? But, uh, you know, it's not odd that a woman would be in the middle of two men fighting and one dies. It happens all the time. An unfortunate thing, but a thing that does happen. And with that understanding, Christian Rafael de Jesus Roca Perez was charged with the murder of Jeffrey. The trial was odd, to say the least. It was presided over by Judge Casey Moreland, and it was going reasonably well. That is, until Martha was put on stand as a witness to the murder, basically uh, in hopes that it would charge Raphael with the murder. But you see, when she was put on the stand, she started saying things that ended up incriminating herself. In the end, the judge had to stop 
the proceedings, saying, If I can see her being charged in this case, uh, probably should be charged in this case. Judge Casey Moreland then told lawyers, This is so bizarre, it is hard to believe. Needless to say, four months later, on August 2005, a grand jury indicted her on one count of first-degree murder, and although she was initially given a plea deal of 20 years, she would do six, she rejected it. Not necessarily a decision made by her either, but one that was influenced by her lawyer, and not a good one either. You see, uh, at the end of the day, Martha Freeman was found guilty, receiving life in prison. She'll be eligible for parole in 2063. As to the defendant, Martha Ann Freeman, we find the defendant guilty of first degree murder. So, Crows, that is the incredibly bizarre story of Martha Freeman. Hope you all enjoyed it. As always, know that you're loved and appreciated. If you haven't heard it today, let me be the first one to tell you you are loved and appreciated. I'll see you in the next one, Crows. Later.